We've got uh, a terrific keynote speaker for you today, uh, somebody who has uh, been a friend of mine going on almost 30 years now, uh, John Nelbandian, uh, judge of the Sixth Circuit, has been there since uh, 2018, just mentioned to me he was having his, uh, his five-year clerk reunion, and I thought, oh my gosh. First he said five-year reunion, and I'm still in the mind, I'm thinking, my God, have I been out of law school that long? I, how is that possible? Um, so uh, John is, uh, is, is, and his colleagues on the Sixth Circuit are uh, many fine ap uh, appointees of Trump and Bush, and, and uh, I don't know if there are any, any Reagan appointees still left, but it's been a, a really, really robust circuit for many years. But uh, John uh, arrived at the Sixth Circuit by way of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister in Cincinnati, where he was a partner for a long time. And um, he was their lead appellate lawyer and indeed was certified by the Ohio Bar Association as a specialist in appellate law. And being a longtime friend of John and somebody who can give him a little ribbing every now and again and seeing that on his resume, it, it called, what I wanted to say to John was, oh, specialist in appellate law. Well, la di da <laughs> Congratulations. Um, before that, though, I think John had probably the most formative experience of his career uh, when he was at Jones Day, and he and I got to practice law together for a few years. We were uh, junior associates uh, together uh, in the mid to late 90s, where we both uh, absorbed some great learning from, from many fine lawyers, including Greg Katzis, now of the DC Circuit, um, and many other uh, terrific leading lights along the way. Uh, but we had a great time back then, and um, he, uh, I think, impressed everybody very quickly. He was probably the only junior level associate on Steve Brogan, the managing partner's speed dial. Uh, John got all the great, the great work because he did such great work. Um, and I think all of that is borne out over his career now as, as he's on the uh, on the uh, Sixth Circuit. Before that, he clerked for Jerry Smith of the Fifth Circuit, uh, and he is a graduate of the, of the Wharton School and of the University of Virginia Law School, where he was editor of the Virginia Law Review. Um, and probably the most important public service that he has rendered aside from being on the Sixth Circuit is that he was the president of the Cincinnati Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. So I think we be very grateful for that. But I do want to tell a story, of course, since I've known John for so long, and, and uh, it's, it's one of my favorites about him. Uh, you know, D.C., very uh, challenging city to get around in, lots of people. Uh, the metro sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Um, and one day we were all comparing notes as junior associates, especially those of us who didn't live in the city. We lived out in in the Virginia suburbs, my goodness, how are you getting to work? And, you know, how are you? Oh, well, you know, I take the 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 Virginia Railway Express, and then I pick up the Metro at Springfield or something, all I do, and I, I personally had this weird thing where I would get dropped off at a, uh, at a restaurant that, where people would line up to take you into the city so you could go into the, in the HOV lanes. And so that was, you know, one of my uh, colleagues kept uh, ribbing me because I was hitchhiking to work, but yeah, that's, that's how I did it. So then it was John's turn. Well, John, how do, you, how do you get to work, John? You live out in Virginia, that must be really challenging. John, lawyers drive. So, here to tell us how it is, John, lawyers drive now Bandian. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I forgot that one, that's a good one. It's true, by the way, lawyers drive. Um, so, um, thank you, uh, Tom. I will say that I'm not a Wabash grad that came up at an earlier panel, but Tom, of course, is, so there you go, that gets taken care of. Um, I did drive over. Um, I used to come here uh, fairly often. Um, I did notice that you all are still diligently working on the road, so I appreciate that. Um, I've had a very busy week. I usually measure that either by, number one, how many times I've had to wear a suit this week, number five for me, and how many times I've had to see Ben Flowers. So we'll get to see him again. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway, thank you. Uh, you know, Tom was the one that invited me here today, and having served in leadership for a long time in the Federal Society, I realized, you know, how hard it is sometimes to get a speaker. 
Um, you kind of start at the pipe dream stage. Can we get a Supreme Court justice, governor, Judge Easterbrook? You eventually end up at what I call the warm body stage. Can we get John Nalbandian? So here I am. Um, now, I was just in Chicago a, a couple of weeks ago. I moderated a couple of panels, and I opened my remarks with this line. I said, I'm John Nalbandian. I'm from the circuit to the east, but I can't guarantee that I'm any wiser than the judges that you have here. It's just kind of a not so clever line, right? But I didn't have a lot of time, so I didn't finish that story, but I'm gonna finish it now, okay? So there's some follow-up. A few years ago, I was meeting a friend of mine um, and he had his girlfriend with him, who's now his wife, and it turns out that she's from Norway. And I said, hello, you know, how are you, I'm John. And I said, hey, I've, do you want to hear, I've got a joke about Norway. And she looked at me and she said, you know, what? You know, why would you ever joke about Norway? And I said, yeah. I said, how do we know that Jesus wasn't born in Norway? And she said, how? And I said, because there aren't three wise men to the east. And she laughed. And of course, Sweden catches the stray on that joke, right? And she laughed, and then she asked the next natural question, which was, do you have a joke for every country? And I said, as long as the country has a neighbor to the east, I've got a joke about it. Um, anyway, here I am, your neighbor to the east. Now, the theme of this conference is education, and I think there are two very hot topics right now um, that that are kind of the intersection of law and education. One is the state of free speech on campus in light of some very high profile incidents at elite law schools. Um, the second I think has come up um, uh, is the rise of artificial intelligence and its impact on legal education generally and well, I, I suppose life generally, but and ensure the future of legal practice. Um, both are very interesting topics. Um, I'm not gonna talk about either one. Although, <laughs> I admit with regard to the second, I am legitimately afraid, um, both by the prospect of robot Judge Nalbandian, who will decide cases in seconds with no typos, okay? And second, by the fundamental kind of existential threat that I think the AI is posing, what I deem the Terminator problem. Um, so put that aside. What am I going to talk about? Um, a decidedly lighter topic. I'm going to talk about the intersection of originalist constitutional theory and a possible implied fundamental right to an education. Um, one thing I think, and it's come up, I think today, the COVID kind of pandemic brought to the forefront are questions about adequate education. Um, we had questions about online education, about whether the closure of schools was depriving students of, of education and their parents um, uh, of, of rights as well. Um, that raises a question, I think, of not only whether quality education is a desirable policy, which it surely is, but also whether students and parents have a fundamental right to that education, that is, a fundamental right under the federal constitution to what I'll call a basic minimum education or perhaps a right to literacy. This question isn't new, of course. The Supreme Court and other courts have grappled with it over the years. Um, in our court, we had a case called Gary B versus Whitmer, which came from Michigan uh, in 2020. The case was about the uh, abysmal conditions uh, in the Detroit public school system I won't go through the details, but you can look it up. I mean, as, as you can imagine, questions about teacher quality, questions about physical plant, all of the things that, that you've heard about. Um, a split panel of our court held that there was a fundamental right to a basic minimum education under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment based in large part on the role that education plays in a free society. Now, although that panel found such a right, there was a very powerful dissent by my colleague, Judge Eric Murphy. The decision eventually was nullified by a vote to take it on banc, and then the case before it could be heard on banc settled. Um, that case though, I think the issue is still out there, and the decision was based on a very familiar, I think, 
fundamental rights framework that we've all gotten used to under the due process clause. Um, one of the keys to the panel's decision was its conclusion that a 1973 school funding case called San Antonio School District versus Rodriguez did not foreclose its holding, although Rodriguez um, suggested, or I should say left open perhaps the possibility that some complete denial of, of education could be a problem. And the panel majority used that as kind of a springboard. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about this issue, not plowing the substantive due process ground. I want to talk about the right to education with an originalist gloss under the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, and before I do that, I want to give just a quick reminder about what originalism is look, looks like. Um, these days, I think original public meaning originalism, what we talk about. Under that view, the meaning of the text, of course, is our starting point. That meaning is fixed at the time of adoption. And in construing the text, we look at the original public meaning of the text, what those words would have been understood to mean at the time that they were adopted. Importantly, we are not asking what the framers of the language would have thought or done when faced with the problem that we are resolving, the so-called original expected application analysis, or what would James Madison do, is not what I'm talking about, okay? Um, instead, we look to original public meaning, and there are two kind of components to that. One is called the fixation thesis, that the meaning of a constitutional provision is fixed at the time of the ratification. The other is called the constraint principle, that we're bound by the meaning of the text. You may or may not agree with any of this. I'm just setting the stage, though. Um, so if we're going to talk about education, I actually have to talk about Brown versus Board of Education, because I think it is the Supreme Court's most famous education case, right? Um, the court, obviously, in Brown held that the separate but equal segregation doctrine had no feel, no place in the field of public education, repudiated Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the old um, segregation case from the 1890s, uh, and concluded that de jure segregation was a deprivation of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. When Brown was first argued in 1952, and as you all may remember, it came out in 1954, was argued in 1952 and re-argued in 1953. Between the time that it was argued the first time and the second time, the Supreme Court actually gave a series of questions to the litigants that it wanted answered. Two of those questions went to the history of the 14th Amendment. They asked whether the Congress that drafted the 14th Amendment or the state legislatures that ratified it had an intention or understanding of the 14th Amendment's impact on segregation in the public schools. Now, those questions from the court, actually prompted by Justice Frankfurter, if you think about it, really were asking about expected application. What would the framers of the 14th Amendment have expected what well, this is the what would James Madison do question okay the court in the opinion if you'll remember concluded that the answers to those questions were inconclusive the court said that it couldn't turn the clock back to 1868 instead the court said it had to rely on and consider public education's um, role in the nation in light of its full development, its present place in American life, a lot of other stuff. Obviously, there was some sociological discussion in the Brown decision. But the, but the key to Brown was that under the Equal Protection uh, Clause, um, the court said that where the state has undertaken to provide such an important, basically fundamental thing, um, the separate but equal can't be uh, tolerated under an anti-discrimination principle. Okay. So what? So let's go from Brown now to what I'm talking about: public meaning originalism. Um, 
Although the court eschewed the framers' intent originalism question in Brown, public meaning originalists now haven't shied away from making the case for Brown. Um, not using the court's logic, but using what we understand as public meaning originalism, right? I wanna talk about this a little bit because um, the question for me, and the real question is, does that have anything to say for us today about whether there is then a fundamental right, not just an anti-discrimination principle, but a fundamental right, absolutely, that you would be entitled to, right? Okay, so um, um, the, what is the case for Brown? What is the case for Brown under public meaning originalism? And we've got a lot of original scholars out there, Michael McConnell, Stephen Calabrese, Christopher Green, Elon Werman. Um, a lot of them have made the, this case for Brown under an originalist reading of the Constitution. Let me kind of see if I can find some common ground because originalists don't all agree on this, this question. But let, look at section one of the 14th Amendment. As you know, there are three clauses that are the main clauses, right? The due process clause, due process of laws clause, equal protection of the laws clause, privileges or immunities clause. Um, although it was a case, um, uh, well, so Brown concluded that de jure segregation in public education violated the 14th Amendment. Out of the three clauses of the 14th Amendment, Brown chose to ground its reasoning in the Equal, equal Protection Clause. Um, but as, leading re as the leading kind of originalists have suggested, there may be a more elegant and textual rationale to resolve Brown, and it's grounded in the Privileges or Immunities Clause. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. That's what the clause says. Now we all know the problem is from law school, right? If you remember the slaughterhouse cases, right? The butcher monopoly in New Orleans in 1873, the Supreme Court said, well, the privileges or immunities clause doesn't really protect that much. It just protects some, a few narrow rights that are fairly insignificant, um, the right to use ports and some other things that were linked to national citizenship. Now that may be an important one. I, 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 don't quote me on that, right? But. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the decision in turn, that decision I think led to two significant pivots in constitutional law. One was to locate the source of implied fundamental rights in the due process clause under the guise of substantive due process, right? Because they were saying, well, that's not in the privileges or immunities clause. So if you think that there are implied fundamental rights, we've looked to the due process clause. Number two, importantly, locate the anti-discrimination principle when a state is providing privileges or immunities in the Equal Protection Clause, okay? So the anti-discrimination principle could also have been a privileges or immunities concept, but instead it's in the Equal Protection Clause. All right, the originalist scholarship now suggests, however, that privileges or immunities is the source of anti-discrimination and the source really of the protection of fundamental rights in the 14th Amendment generally. That the Equal Protection Clause is really about protecting your citizens, right? If you remember your history in Reconstruction, you know, blacks were being subject to violence from, you know, whites, Ku Klux Klan, others that wasn't being punished. Literally, they weren't being protected by the laws. Due process, and you've seen the familiar debates about due process, seems to be about process, not about whether we have rights, but I'll set that aside. Anyway, um, so the question in Brown was about discrimination, and under an originalist reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the specific question would be whether the state's provision of taxpayer-funded public education is strong enough to trigger the anti-discrimination principle. Long story short, what the originalists have suggested is that in 1868, and certainly by 1954, public education was essentially a civil right protected in state constitutions that triggers a right to equal treatment by the state when it comes to providing the right or that right or privilege of citizenship. 
In other words, if the state provides public education, it may not then discriminate in how it provides education. Therefore, race-based classifications are out because they would abridge the citizens' privileges or immunities. That's the anti-discrimination. That's the case for Brown. Okay, can we get to the main question? Um, what is the implication from the originalist case for Brown on the possible existence of an implied fundamental right to education itself? This is a complicated question. <laughs> um, there are two main questions here. Number one, what rights, if any, does the Privileges or Immunities Clause protect in the absolute? Okay. Number two, is some variation of a right to education one of them? Um, as you can imagine, original scholarships have come down in a variety of ways on these questions. In fact, I would suggest that questions about what the Privileges or Immunities Clause covers has produced the sharpest disagreement among original scholarship uh, scholars that we have. Um, I don't know, get them in a room talking about non-delegation and they're also maybe fisticuffs. Okay, but <laughs> this one, this one, all right. Um, let me sketch out a couple of the main kind of possibilities of where we are, um, the views on that. Uh, number one, the clause protects no rights absolutely. All it does is ensure that positive law rights that the state provides, like contract, property, education, are all provided to the citizens equally. In other words, the Privileges or Immunities Clause is actually about non-discrimination only. That's one view. Number two, the clause protects only individual rights that are enumerated in the Bill of Rights or just the first eight amendments, and perhaps any right otherwise enumerated in the text of the Constitution, the right to habeas, the criminal jury trial right that's in the text. Um, this, by the way, would take care of the incorporation issue, right, where we use the due process clause to do incorporation, which has always been very messy. Uh, Justice Thomas has espoused this view, I think, in the McDonald case, and I think in Tim's, in Tim's general, yeah, yeah? okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> Obviously, if that were to be the case, the right to a basic minimum education would not be covered because it is not in the Bill of Rights or in the text of the Constitution. All right, third view, the Constitution, the clause protects rights, positive law rights that are widely extended by the states to citizens today and rights that were strongly protected in 1868 may no longer be protected, like for example, freedom of contract, um, that would be kind of an evolving view uh, that, would, that would be shrinking and growing. Um, that is an interesting view. Okay, fourth, some scholars like Stephen Calabrese have suggested that we look at all rights deemed fundamental in 1868, and part of this analysis would look at state constitutions in 1868 and ask whether a supermajority of states recognize the right. So that would freeze us in time in 1868. Fifth, and this is the Professor Randy Barnett and Evan Burnick have advocated, um, and this you can mix and match. So they say it's the enumerated rights from the Constitution, including rights that are later enumerated, okay? Civil rights specified in the Reconstruction, Reconstruction Civil Rights Act of 1866, so obviously there is the common view that the one of the goals of the 14th Amendment was to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which included the right to own property, the right to contract, the right to sue, other things. And importantly, they would suggest that there are other unenumerated rights that are deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, an inquiry that is very similar to the substantive due process inquiry under Washington versus Glucksburg. Okay. Importantly for that last category, I think for the right to education, the, the right should be consistent with an approach that an old federal court opinion from Justice Bushrod Washington issued when he was writing circuit called Corfield versus Coriel, which interpreted the privileges and immunities clause of Article 4 and espouse what I think is more of a natural rights approach. So in other words, the Barnett view would say, well, we should look at the Corfield model um, 
and I, it's, I mean, it's a little bit of an obscure opinion in the sense that it's a, it's a justice of the Supreme Court writing circuit. It's not obscure in the rights sphere. Like if you like to talk about rights, you know what Corfield's all about. Um, I'm not sure you all want to go down that road, but if you ever do go down that road, that. Um, importantly, the latter category of unenumerated rights does not necessarily mean only new rights but can include fundamental rights, like perhaps the right of parents to raise their children, which may be universally acknowledged but not otherwise enumerated. Um, importantly, originalists who believe that the Privileges or Immunities Clause protects some un unenumerated rights are mindful of the problem of unduly empowering judges to the detriment of state legislatures, which is, of course, the age old question or one of the age old constitutional interpretation questions, right? Why does an unelected judge get to do, well, anything really? <laughs> um, okay. The question becomes really how deeply rooted a right is or in the, this is the way that professors Barnett and Burnick describe it. They say a right can be deemed a fundamental civil right if lots of people who thought about citizenship in roughly the same way deemed it to be important enough to citizenship for a long time. Very interesting. All right, so obviously would require very broad state con consensus. Um, what do we make of these views? Well, it seems clear to me that any originalist view that requires enumeration in the Constitution um, or recognizes that, or suggests the Privileges and Immunities Clause protects no rights at all, absolutely, just anti-discrimination, there would in fact be no right to education that would take care of it. Um, you would have to accept the view that the clause does protect some rights. This is the Calabrese view that uh, rights that were protected in 1868. Steve Calabrese did a survey. He says that 92% of the states of the 37 states in 1868 recognized some fundamental duty to provide public education in their state constitutions. And by the way, did not have de jure segregation provisions, um, which did quickly come after that, but not necessarily in 1868. Um, uh, I think it would be a stretch though to say that the public education systems in 1868 are close to the ones that we think of now, but I don't know whether at some level of generality, if it's in the state constitution, he says that's at least evidence that it's at least some kind of a right. Um, under, the, um, under the view that it's not frozen in 1868, obviously the data, um, I, I assume the case would be stronger because uh, the importance of public, public education, I think most of us would agree, has, has increased over time um, to the point where it could be deemed a civil right, perhaps rooted in history and tradition. Um, what, Bar what Professor Barnett and Professor Burnick say is they look at a 30 year horizon, you know, what is the, um, you know, what is the state of that right or view of that right over kind of a generation or two and how fundamental and how important is it? Um, let me turn to the current court for a second before I conclude, um, and I wanna work from the last point. Um, the Supreme Court obviously has acknowledged that education plays a fundamental role in the, our Republican society. Brown says that, Rodriguez says that, there are, there are other Plyler versus Doe, there are other education cases. I mean, it's essentially said education is perhaps the most important function of a state and local government. Um, with that precedent in mind, I think it's worth noting that the court is, I think, about as originalist as it's ever been, at least with respect to what I'm talking about in public meaning originalism. The court has declined to relocate substantive due process jurisprudence within the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Um, you know, there was an invitation to do so in McDonald, which was the gu which was the gun case, um, and Justice. Thomas, who I believe was the fifth vote in that case, I think would have done it. So I don't know if you want to play little Marx type games, but um, but you know we saw in Dobbs that the court analyzed it with the with the with the substantive due process framework uh, 
Um, we do know a couple of interesting things, though. The court does seem to care about 1868, or at least the Dobbs opinion mentioned 1868 as an important kind of thing, right? Because that's when the 14th Amendment adopted. And the court cares about history and tradition. If you noticed a little bit, Dobbs, Bruin, uh, the Kennedy, the First Amendment case, religion case, uh, all three of those opinions, the court talks a little bit about history and tradition in a way that I suggest is a little bit different, perhaps, than it has talked about it before. Um, so um, if you look, if you accept that there is some protection of unenumerated rights and privileges or immunities clause, whether it's fixed in 1868 or not, um, you know, it looks like a basic minimum education. You could make some case for it. I'm not saying it would be how I would decide a case. I can't say that, but it would be, um, there would be something to say. Um, I, the other interesting thing I think is that originalist research about this topic can certainly influence the court, even if the court doesn't take the kind of the privileges or immunities approach. Because like I said, the history and tradition is important. Um, now, let me, I, let me go through a couple of the uh, arguments that are kind of, uh, let me say, objections or other arguments about this kind of fundamental right. And, and Eric Murphy, my good friend Eric Murphy, covered this in his dissent in Gary Vee and I think did a very comprehensive job. One of the interesting objections to public education when you think about rights as a right is that normally we frame fundamental rights jurisprudence in the language of negative liberty, right? It's the government can't interfere with my right to do something, my right to own property or, or sign a contract or, well, I guess Lochner is gone, but you know, some other one. Um, there aren't a lot of rights that you have a right to something. The government has to give it to you in positive terms. That you think about maybe the right to counsel, but that's enumerated. So unenumerated rights, I think, become difficult. Um, part of this issue is a framing issue, right? The right to vote, the right to marry. Are those positive rights or are they negative rights? I mean, if you frame them in a certain way, the, 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 the state can't keep you from doing, from getting married. Maybe you could get married in a state of nature, so then it would all be kind of a negative right. Although on the other hand, you get benefits from the state. So it looks, there is some positive positivity, I suppose, to it. Um, one of the things about this framing issue and the negative rights issue um, that's interesting is to what extent is it a byproduct of locating implied fundamental rights in the due process clause? So if you were actually going to look at the text of the due process clause, it talks about depriving someone of life, liberty, or property, not on failing to provide life, liberty, or property. So if you were looking for some textual hook for implied fundamental rights in the due process clause, you might settle on negative liberty, right? Because you were looking and found this textual hook. I'm not sure that makes sense, but I can try to explain it later maybe. <laughs> anyway, so um, if, implied fundamental rights, though, are located in the Privileges or Immunities Clause, then perhaps that paradigm shifts and maybe some positive rights are open um, that wouldn't be. And also, interestingly enough, Professor Calabrese in one of his articles says, hey, look, the right to education, this may be odd that we would have a positive right to anything, okay? But the right to education may be the one, the only one, that is justified by originalist research. So keep that in mind. Um, the ultimate problem with this, the ultimate problem with the right to education is what does it look like, right? What is it? I mean, a basic minimum education, how are federal courts gonna define it? How, how would you decide whether it would be violated? What would the remedies be, right? We've all had these problems with courts that you know, can they can they order tax increases? I mean, that all of that is bound up in this, right? Is it a resource allocation, right? Is it input based? Do ultimate results matter? Test scores, you know, do, do, do would lower test scores suggest that you were being denied a fundamental right? 
I think most people would say, well, no, there's no right to kind of equal outcomes, right? Are they probative of whether something's problematic? I mean, it would seem like they might be probative. Um, so that administrative problem may ultimately be what prevents any of this from happening. Um, some would suggest in a place like Detroit, it doesn't matter what you want to make it look like or measure it, it's a problem and it's pretty stark. You know, what, however you accept whatever it is, you define it and I will tell you Detroit is a problem. So that could, that could also be, that could also be uh, an issue. Anyway, let me conclude with this. Um, I talked a lot about Brown. I talked a lot about the original case of Brown. I think it's very important. Um, ultimately though, as you can tell, I think inconclusive about whether there's an originalist case for an implied right to education, there are many originalists who view the case for Brown as compelling and who also view the case for a right to education as a non-starter. So I leave it to you all to sort it out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>